And for more on the question of whether Donald Trump should be barred from the 2024 ballot, as well as some reflections on the past year in politics, we turn to Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post. Good to see you both. Good to see you. So as we've just reported, Maine has joined Colorado as the second state to ban Donald Trump from its presidential primary ballot under a constitutional provision that prevents insurrectionists from holding office. David, what's your assessment of this decision by Maine's Secretary of State? Yeah, I thought Colorado was pretty terrible, and I think this is an even worse threat to democracy. Some random Democratic politician throwing the Republican frontrunner off the ballot uh, for a tr crime, as you said in one of your questions, which he's not even been convicted of, he hasn't even been charged with. Uh, the pro process should always be voters decide, voters decide. It should be that doubly when we have an entire democratic system is under a crisis of authority and people don't trust it, they think the game is rigged. If suddenly you have random people throwing people off the ballot, they're going to think, oh, the game really is rigged. And then if you have one Democrat throwing a candidate off the ballot in Maine, do you really think some Republicans aren't going to start throwing people off the ballot somewhere else? Uh, it's just, I just thought it was a terrible decision. Uh, and one that confirms every story that Donald Trump tells, which is those liberal elites are out to get you. And suddenly, I don't know if she's a liberal elite, but somebody's out to, somebody's out to silence your voice. Jonathan, what about that, 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 that argument that this is election interference of a different sort? <laughs> My gosh, David, um, um, I, I don't buy it. Um, the, the idea that this is, you know, a cabal of liberal elites attacking democracy, going after Donald Trump, is ridiculous. One, because these these challenges are being brought by Republicans. The, there are Republicans who are trying to keep Donald Trump off the Republican primary ballot. That is definitely the case in Colorado, and the same people who brought that case are involved in all the other cases. The other thing is, you know, these aren't random, the, the main Secretary of State is not some random uh, official. This is someone who didn't just make up this, this decision out of whole cloth. She had a hearing a week ago, an eight hour long hearing, where she, you know, had all sorts of briefs, all sorts of testimony, and you know, she came to her decision. The key thing here is that this case is going to go before the Supreme Court because the one thing the Supreme Court does not like is um, dissonance within, within the country. You've got Colorado and Maine saying he's gotta be off the ballot. You have Michigan, and I, I believe today California said Trump is on the ballot. You can't have a hodgepodge of decisions around the country involving something this major. So the Supreme Court is going to have to decide this case. And as the Minnesota Secretary of State said to me last weekend, you know, he sees the Supreme Court deciding unanimously either um, all states have to have him on the ballot or all states have to have him off the ballot. But there's not going to be this split the baby decision. How do you think the court might weigh this? Yeah, we have an island of agreement among us. <laughs> <of disagreement. laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I would be shocked if it's not, I don't know if it would be nine nothing, but I would be shocked if the Supreme Court took Donald Trump's no, name off the ballot anywhere. Uh, the last thing the court, which had already has its own credibility problems, wants to do is be seen to tell 75 million Americans, the guy you want to vote for, you can't vote for that guy. Uh, that, would, that would create some sort of democratic crisis in our country. Jonathan, how much weight do you give that question, though, of, you know, why can one person, in this case, Maine, make a determination for thousands of voters as to uh, Donald Trump's political future? Well, that's a matter of state law. I mean, elections, the, the rules in all these states, the reason why we're having these hodgepodge, this hodgepodge of decisions is because elections are run by the states, and they have their own laws. And in Maine, the Secretary of State makes a determination, and then it goes to the courts. So this is, not the, this is not the end in Maine. This is the beginning in Maine. Well, as this decision came down yesterday from Maine, Nikki Haley was in New Hampshire, Donald Trump's uh, ascendant rival there, uh, trying to clean up a response she gave when she was asked by a, a person at a town hall you see there in New Hampshire about what was the cause of this civil war. And she did not name slavery in her response. And after much backlash, she later said, of course it had to do with slavery. David, what did you make of her initial comment and then her attempt to clean it up and clarify it? I mean, I think yeah, it Republican uh, presidential candidates should not be disagreeing with Lincoln's second inaugural. Uh, Lincoln knew this was a war about slavery. For 30 years we had the war, the America was split over slavery, then the war happened, it was about slavery, slavery ended with the war. Uh, I like Ron DeSantis' line that the 
ending slavery was one of the Republican Party's greatest accomplishments ever. Uh, and so I think what was disturbing about her comment was that it, it had the aroma of somebody playing political games from South Carolina. That you're from a state where a lot of people don't want to say it was about slavery. They want to say it was about random civil rights or whatever. Uh, and then she had that voice in her head, and she thought the politically calculated thing to do was to give the answer she gave rather than the honest truth. And that is a bad moment for her. Yeah. What about that, that her remarks suggest her reading of the audience, that they would object to her saying flatly and plainly that, yes, it had to do with slavery? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I agree with David. The only thing I would say is that it's not an aroma, it's a stench. <laughs> I mean, she is the former governor of South Carolina, the first state to secede from the Union, which was um, led to the Civil War over slavery, a state that had a proclamation in 1860 that said flat out, we don't, the non-enslaving states are trying to make us give up slavery. So for her to do what she did, especially after what she did, after the, the, the massacre in Charleston uh, at Mother Emanuel, probably her you know, biggest moment on the national stage, and certainly as governor of South Carolina, stepping up and being a leader and taking down the Confederate flag, for her to backtrack like this, I shouldn't be surprised because you know she's backtracked on a lot of uh, on a lot of statements of principle, especially when she got in league with Donald Trump. Well, Chris Christie agrees with you. Here's what he told New Hampshire voters about this uh, earlier this week. She didn't say what she said last night and today about this because she's dumb. She's not. She's smart and she knows better. And she didn't say it because she's a racist. Because she's not. I know her well, and I don't believe Nikki has a racist bone in her body. But for purposes of this race, the reason she did it is just as bad, if not worse. And she get everybody concerned about her candidacy. She did it because she's unwilling to offend anyone by telling the truth. So, so what about that? I mean, he, he's saying that she equivocates and pulls her punches for political gain. How damaging... Will something like that be to her standing in New Hampshire? First, this is a lesson to young viewers to major in history, because our first two topics are about the Insurrection Act and the Civil War, so <laughs> you should major in history. <laughs> no escaping America. We're still living with the Civil War legacies, clearly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, um, I don't think it'll end up hurting her. I think the people who are voting for her in New Hampshire, or say they're going to be voting for her in New Hampshire, are doing it as an anti-Trump, and maybe they kind of like her, and maybe they'll have a moment of pause. And she got a lot of big bucks from a lot of rich people. And maybe they'll have a moment of pause, but compared to Donald Trump, uh, stupid, insensitive, uh, terrible comments uh, will not be deterrents because Donald Trump produces those by the minute. Well, on this final Friday of 2023, I want to get your reflections on the major political uh, threads and themes of the year. Jonathan, you first. Oh, of course. You <laughs> come to me first. Look, we've, we have gone, we have been through it in, in 2023, and it's only going to get uh, bumpier, I think, in 2024. We've got two huge constitutional questions that are about to come before the Supreme Court. One, ballot access, and the other one is presidential immunity. Um, we've never been in a situation where, those, where the Supreme Court has had to even entertain these questions. And the ramifications of that for the 2024 election means that we say this every four years, this is the most important election of our lifetime. But quite honestly, 2024 could be um, the most important election because it could be the last democratic, small d democratic election this country ever has. And that's the one thing that gives me pause about 2024. Mm. David, how about you? Yeah, I mean, we've emphasized all year how terrible the political system is right now. And as Jonathan said, next year's probably going to be worse. But to me, our national situation has been solved, S-A-L-V-E-D, um, by the strength of the economy by a lot of good things that are happening underneath politics. So economic growth is phenomenal right now. Unemployment is low. Inflation is down. Income inequality is down. Wages are up. Real wages are up. And so if it was not predicted that we would reduce this inflation without sliding into recession. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be doing it. And if we had not, if we'd fallen into 7% unemployment, 10%, can you imagine where the country would be? So just to pay tribute maybe to the Fed. Or, uh, or maybe, <laughs> but to somebody, the economy's really good. And the best thing is America's not a country in decline. 
our economy is outpacing Europe, Japan, China now. And so there are underlying good forces in America uh, that we're all wounded by, by how Donald Trump wants us to feel every day. But there's a lot of good coming, including, except for in Washington, D.C., really rapidly decreasing crime rates. Mm -hmm. And so th there's just a lot of decent fundamentals in this society. Well, we will end on that hopeful note. <laughs> David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, thanks for an incredible year. And we'll see you, I guess, next year. Yes, <laughs> we'll be here. All right, take care. All right.